a minute. So it's good to be here today, isn't it? It's beautiful weather. And I think it's so funny. I was thinking about the news media, how they just talk about how hot it is. And it's always this way. It's supposed to be a summertime. <laughs> you know, would you rather it be ice and snow? <laughs> not me. <laughs> Some people like the cold weather, but I like all weather as long as it's not tornadic. So uh, I finished writing chapter 25 last week. It's a long Pay, uh, long lessons. It's going to take us several lessons to go through it. So Kay is editing it right now and she's going to send me back to other chapters that she's edited and then we're going to put it together in the book and we're going to get it out. So those of you on Facebook, uh, won't be long. I'll put it on our web page and you'll be able to order it and Kay will make it available too. And so you'll have the first volume, which is nine chapters. I think it's like a hundred and 190 pages. So unless Kay adds another 10 or 15 pages to it. <laughs> Highly likely we could, but uh, it's been good. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's really blessed my life learning that God never required sacrifice. I'm, be, I'm getting a lot of calls, and so does Kay, but people, it's just, it's different. And I said, well, when we first met Brother Garner and he taught us, what, the six steps to the throne, that was different, right? And anytime you receive revelation, it is different. If what you're learning is something you've always heard all your life, then are you growing? I don't think so, you know? Uh, we left the elementary realm and, and the physical teaching and went to high school. And if all they taught us was the same stuff as they taught us in first and second grade, why don't we just quit and go on and enjoy our life, right? And that's why I tell people, if you're going to churches that's teaching the same thing they always taught, then why don't you go fishing, go have some fun. <laughs> you know, go, you've already learned all that and go enjoy the world. But uh, learning is a progressive. You know, it's like my son, he went to grade school, he went to high school, he went to college, and then he found out he wasn't educated enough to make the kind of money he wants, so he went back to college and he learned more. And because he's learned more, and now he's a stress management prof uh, uh, profession, uh, or professional, now his income is exponentially more. And guess what? He could go back to school and learn more, right? There's always more to learn. So in, the, in what we call the church world, let's don't get stuck. But, and and I, it saddens me you know, well, I shouldn't say it sadly. Some people are happy where they're at, but there's so much more. I love, I'll never forget Roger Legg teaching what Jesus did is much more. Yes. And it is much more. We haven't even begun to tap in to the much more, but we're getting there. So I want to go back to uh, where we left off last week in 2 Timothy 1.9. Uh, I want to read that again. Sometimes we need to, we could take, well, we can. We could take one verse and preach a whole hour just on that verse, you know, by breaking it down. But it starts out with who, and we know who the who was. It was God who hath saved us. There's, there's a real key word that people need to look at. What, what is hath? Is that, is that something that has to take place in the future? Hath, H-A-T-H? -H? It's past tense, right? So if you were born of your mama, and when you were old enough to read and understand something, and you read something that says hath saved, wouldn't you think I was saved before I was born? When you think that already took place? Yes. And that's in the King James Version. It's not my translation. It's there. So it's good morning, Kent. Good to, see, good to not see you, but know you're there. But so God hath saved. And the word saved means pres preserved. It means made whole. It can also be used as rescued because in the awareness of the salvation that we need today is something that rescues us from something. And what we need to be rescued from is those false beliefs that we had. Uh, those lies that we always believe we were just sinners saved by grace. So we got saved, but we're still just sinners. So again, that doesn't make sense to me either. So it says he hath done all this. He, he made us whole and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. So there again, this verse could really confirm the fact you don't have to do anything. I, I saw a debate on Facebook the other day about how our works have to prove who we are. And it's, it's not according to our works but according to his purpose, according to his grace, according to his love. We can, he created us. When me and Donna, in our biological way, created a child, we did that because we loved that child. And we had a life planned out for that child. And the goal was for us to always take care of their needs until they become an adult. And even at that, we still love them so much. If they need something, we want to help them. So again, how much more is our father? Yes. So, which, has, which was given in Christ Jesus, and there's a key word. Does it say before in your Bible? 
It was given in Christ Jesus before the world begun. It was all done. Then verse 10, but is now, which is Jesus' entire life, because we're still talking about God and Jesus. So, but now, uh, Jesus' entire life was made manifest, or actually revealed by the appearing of our Savior. So everything that took place in Jesus' earth walk was revealed by him. And it says, he's abolished death and hath brought life and immortality. What's the next phrase? To light, correct? To light, to understanding. It was already, already there. Immortality is already part of our being. We should not be affected by the sense realm. We sh immortality doesn't get sick and weak and, and die needlessly. Immortality doesn't get cancer. Immortality, you know, if we really understood what immortality is. So he brought that to light, to understanding through the gospel. Which is the death, burial, and resurrection. The death, burial, and the resurrection. So crucified, died, very quick, and raised and seated. We value that, but we now we, we don't see that. And I'm going to have to take that book off the internet now and get it fixed up. What? But the six steps of the throne wasn't to change us from somebody we was to who we are. It was a revealing of God's love. And remember we said that Jesus came to stop the sacrificial system. That was one of those. And so you need somebody to suffer, I'll suffer. If you think you need somebody to be tormented on a cross, I'll do that. If you think you need somebody, a, a, a goat to, to press the sins of the people on, I will be that goat. And that's what happened at the cross. So crucified, died, very quickly raised and seated was a revelation to us. It wasn't something to make us new, which I'll show you that later on. I taught it for years, you know, and, but, but it wasn't. We, it was to wake us up the whole process. Everything that we were taught that we needed to do, we need to replace that to we need to wake up to. You don't need to do anything to become anything. You need to wake up. Are you all awake? Are you awake physically? Because I'm not hearing anybody amen and shouting. No, I don't need that. I'm, I'm playing with you. But the people on the internet need to hear that. Well, I mean, was it not manifested though? It had to be manifested through Jesus Christ. It was, ma but the word manifest, I'm going to show you that. Thank you for asking because here's the answer. The good question, baby. I love my wife. She, she, she thinks ahead and asks questions a lot. So he brought us the revelation, not correction. Okay. Are, are even making us new as we once believed. The new King James uses the word revealed rather than manifest because that's what it was. It was actually revealed. So the phrase is made manifest is the New Testament number 5319 and it's Phanerol, P-H-A-N-E-R-O-O -O, and that's the Oklahoma version to that. And it's, it says to re render apparent. Remember scripture says in the King James, when Christ who is your life but it actually says, they added the who is, when Christ, your spirit, your life. That's what it says. When Christ, your spirit, renders very apparent to you, then you shall appear as Christ the new man. That's what it actually says. And But the, the, the King James Version that they put in there, they wanted you to think it's talking about Jesus, when Jesus renders a very, because they want us to keep worshiping Jesus. And I know that's hard for people. I love what Jesus did. I would love to have met Jesus. I, you know, but I, I have met Jesus. I've met God. Amen. And I met, I have the understanding. But Jesus, the earth walking Jesus is not my life. My spirit is my life. And the same spirit that he had. It's the very same spirit that he lived with. And he knew how to live out of his life. Yes. Right? Yes. He lived out of it completely. And it was powerful. He spoke to the elements. He, he, he did all kinds of things that a man who lives by the sense realm could not do. Correct? So it's when Christ, my life, when my spirit, see, and that's why we pray, Lord, help us understand that we are spirit more than we are flesh and blood. Amen. That it's, it's that our spirit is our life source, not our good ideas. See, so there's a thing called humanism today where people think it's just us apart from the spirit of God. And when I, I, I talked to uh, Anna Carl's friend the other day when we were praying, I was talking about putting into our imagination. And I know she was thinking, I was thinking apart from God, but no, my imagination is given to me of, of God. My imagination is creative, it's my spirit. And so when that renders very apparent, so this here is, is when it, Jesus rendered apparent to show us God's love. And then it comes from P-H-A-N-E-R, oh, excuse me, comes from P-H-A-N-E-R-O-S, which means shining, apparent, 
uh, publicly, externally, and it comes from, uh, comes from phineo, phineo, it means to lighten or to show. And remember, remember the Shulamite, Solomon came along and said, honey, you're a garden uh, enclosed and a well shut up. And then we used to sing that as a little child. I ain't going to let Satan foof it out, you know, blow out my candle. I'm going to let my light shine. You know, if we, we just needed to understand what that was talking about. And so Jesus came to show us who we were. Yes. And that's why he told Nicodemus, you need to remember who you are. You don't need to become anything. You already are who you are. How many times have you wanted to go to your children as they're making uh, uh, bad life choices and say, that's not who you are. You need to remember who you are. I didn't give birth to you to live this kind of life. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't work and make money and provide you a home and provide you a college education so you can go out and live like you have nothing. Amen. That's what Jesus came to do, to show us who we are. Does that help you, Donna? Yep. Don Faith. So the gospel is this. Christ appeared to reveal the way things always were with the Father. Jesus' appearing was to render apparent, public and externally, who Father was. He was to show us the love of God. He came to stop the sacrificial system. He came to show us the love of God. And he came to destroy the false, illegal, degenerate nature activity. The people themselves weren't degenerate, but their activity was degenerate because they were living out of a false identity or what's often called a mistaken identity. So Jesus was everything, and so are we. Jesus was all God, all man. We're all man. We're all God. 100% God. There's nothing left out whatsoever. All that he is, we are in a body. So as our father in this earth, uh, Jesus, just as much as Jesus was in his earth walk, we are our father in the earth. My children image me. My son really images me a lot. My grandkids do. My, uh, and, and Donna a lot. But image or favor, that means we look like them. And I, I just, I was just thinking today, I just, I told y'all last week to start using your imagination for God things. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to imagine what it's like for children to be born to parents who know who they are. I'm beginning to imagine where, where we have political leaders that know who they are and they function out of who they are. And, and other religions to find out who they are and imagine what it's gonna be like. You know, John Lennon, he, he wrote that song, wasn't it? I can only imagine. But no, we can't just only imagine. Oh, no, no, excuse me. That, that's a Christian song. I'm sorry. I gave the wrong credit to him. That's a song about I can only imagine what it's going to be like. You know, No, I'm imagining what is true. It's already true. But I'm beginning by faith to see that awakening take place in the world. To where we have a president and congressmen and senators who know who they are and know what they're here for. Speak loudly so this, they can hear this. I, I heard the other day a person say, our lives will follow our vision. Yes. So may we increase and see what's really true of us that we can walk and follow. Yeah, and, and, and what does scripture say? My people perish with, they have no vision. And see, I was, a lot of my friends told me that means I need to have a vision of what our ministry is gonna be like. You know, and what our church is going to be like. No, that's not it. Is it's our vision is seeing something. It's it's seen spiritually. True vision is seen spiritually, not just our eyesight. That's why the, the Bible talks about there's a lot of people blind. Well, it's not talking about physically blind. They're blind to the things of God. And just like the word dead with God, and in the Bible, it's not talking so much about physical death, but it's dead to the knowledge of God. There's a lot of people in this earth walking around totally dead to God, aren't they? dead to the voice of God. He's always talking, always calling people up, but there's too much distraction, too much distraction. Mm -hmm. So now we can understand that the apocalypse is the disclosure of Jesus Christ is saying something to us concerning who we always were and not something who we need to become. And I'm so thankful for that. Because most of my life, I've always been trying to become, haven't you? I've always been trying to do what's right, to please God, and I always failed at it. And the reason I failed at it because God was already pleased with me. Yeah. So what was it? It was a dead work, yes. right? And that's one of the, the uh, in the book of Hebrews, I, talk, I think it talks about to, to, to repent from dead works and others quit it. You don't need to do anything to please me. It's, it's a dead work and it's getting nothing for you. So we're hearing fresh truth and not the same old gloom and doom and despair.
We, I, and I, I, there again, I say we must not desire the past teachings that reaffirm the lie that we were just in our saved by grace. You know, uh, we, we miss full gospel assembly. We love the people. We love Pastor Hibbard. We loved all of that. But the majority of, of not just him, but a lot of people that came through there, was it's always sinner saved by grace. And how many times did Christians get saved over and over and over? <laughs> how many times did Melanie say she got saved? About eight times, something like that. <laughs> you know, because you, you never feel right. And Kay, Kay quoted Don Keithley. Uh, he posted uh, the, the uh, pastor of Grace uh, Seminary and the, and the college, the school down there. He posted, and he put, actually, we were found in Christ before we were lost in Adam. Because we never were lost. <laughs> you know, so God had a solution before there became a man-perceived problem. And it was a man-perceived problem. And if you perceive something to be a problem, it is for you, right? You know, you can look at it. Well, it, it always is. If you, if you put your faith in money as your supply and there's not enough there, then it becomes a problem. And it, and it causes all kinds of problems. It causes... Worry causes doubt. Money causes divorce more than anything else. You know, the lack of money causes divorce. And uh, the next thing you know, you go to the world's ways and you get loans and all that because you don't think you have enough money. You look at a car and you don't think it's a good enough car, so you perceive there's a problem there and you fall prey to what the world offers you. Because the world tells us we all need brand new cars. <laughs> I've never seen so many new cars on the highway. And all you don't see old cars anymore unless they're classics and they're worth a lot of money. So Donna's pointing to her Bible. Stick with the Bible, honey. Stick with the Bible. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so in verse 10, we see where it says, it is revealed by the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's referring to Jesus' appearing. It's not, we're not waiting for Jesus to come back and reveal anything. It was Jesus. That's why we still say you should study the gospel of Jesus Christ, but now with even more understanding. And so, uh, Therefore, the cross did not change anything about God, and the cross didn't change anything about you. Well, that's a bold statement. I'm glad Brother Garner's saying amen right now. <laughs> he is. He knows the truth. God does not change, does he? There's no variables. There's nothing with God. And when he created in his image, that's that's not going to change. It can't change. We can We can... When he sees us, he sees the end from the beginning. So wherever you're at today, he sees you the way you were when he created you. Where you're going to be at 20 or 30 years from now, you're the way he created you. The day that your body ceases to be able to hold you, and I hope there will be a day that that stops, Amen. but the day that your body ceases to be able to hold you, you are who he was in the very beginning. You're still his offspring, and he loves you unconditionally. So he was never mad. You know, remember Justin Phillips putting that sign up, God's not mad at you? And the whole city got mad at him. <laughs> God's not mad at you, but your preacher is. <laughs> right? You're not giving enough money. You're not serving in the church. You don't dress the way I think you should dress. You know, you got to tap. Huh? Yeah, we did. We put, we put up a sign like that too, and a man just put all kinds of horrible, hateful scripture. Did You, you never heard that? Yeah, when we were at uh, Tree of Life on uh, Southwest 4th Street Moore, we put a big sign up like that. And uh, one, one day we drove out there and there was a great big cardboard box, tall, with all kinds of Old Testament scriptures about the wrath of God, the anger of God. And God is, he said, God is mad as hell at you. And that day a real big rain came down <laughs> and it just washed it away and it ended up in the front of our church. So he probably took it over there, he or she. But somebody was really mad. <laughs> and they reflect that on God. See, I think sometimes because sermons are so hell, fire, and damnation, the preacher's mad. The preacher's mad at you and the preacher is mad at himself. Usually what people preach against the most is what they struggle with. Yes. Right? Ice cream. I confess. Yeah, you just don't understand. You can't imagine somebody being mad when it's because the sign is in front of a church that says God's not mad at you. He has I, I know. love for you. I know. And they were just... Very, very angry. angry. Well, you should look at my Facebook page when I put the post about Orge. You know, I put it on my page. I put it on... Uh, 
Global Grace Seminaries page, and I put it on uh, the Spiritual Misfits page. And uh, the majority of them are right on, but then some other people jump on there, and I mean, they got angry. Uh, I wouldn't say angry, but they begin to go to all different references to orge from other translations, and, and they, they translated the word wrath, not orge. You know, and so in the English, wrath is a bad thing. You know, and they said, well, my book shows this and my book shows that. And I thought, you know what? If you want to fight to have an angry God, go ahead. I didn't say anything, but I, but I explained it. And I said, they, they, what they do is they see where it says the passionate love of God and all, or not, it doesn't say love of God, the passionate longing for, but then Strong's writes all the bad stuff because that was his perception. He was, a, he was under the control of the Catholic Church himself. And then other translations, I've said this before, they do the same thing. So instead of saying what, where the word wrath came from, they see orge, but then they still add the English translation of the word wrath. And it's, it's not true. So that's what makes them mad. But, you know, I, I have people writing me wanting to know how I translate scriptures. A few of my very close friends that I trust to do that, I send them my PC Bible study and I'm explaining how to do it. But you don't just translate scripture just because you want to. I'm sorry, and I don't think I'm anybody special, but I've been on a long, long journey, and I do have a thorough understanding of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, and I do have eyes that go see with the love of God now, and that's why I translate it. And uh, that's like saying, well, I'm a doctor, and you want to be a doctor. Would you send me your book? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you ain't operating on me. <laughs> so I always say be very careful when you translate. You make sure you're listening to your spirit. And because it can really confuse you a lot. So I'm going to say this again. The cross did not change anything about God. You should, you should write that down. You should put it on your mirror. The cross did not change anything about God and it didn't change anything about me. I am who I always was. I am who I was created. See, there are preachers and teachers that teach you that a baby is born a sinner. You ever heard that? Born a sinner. Now they act like sinners. <laughs> They poop in their pants and they throw up and they throw the milk and they scream at night and you can't sleep. But that's not a sinner. That's a baby. <laughs> so guess what you are when you do things that don't fit who you are? You're just acting like a baby. It's not who you are. I, I can't tell you how many times that lady's acted like a baby with me. This morning I accidentally threw away her uh, rock sugar. What's that called? Rock sugar. Rock sugar. <laughs> well, I needed a place to put my new stevia sugar, and it, and it was all stuck, and I thought it was old. And I, man, she and I, she went to get it for her tea, and I didn't know she was. She, she was the most horrible baby I've ever seen in my life. I literally wanted to put a pacifier in her mouth. I said, "Baby, we can buy some more." <laughs> I'm glad she don't want to preach. So my question is, is why, this is another big one. Why would God ever, why would God ever need to forgive you? I need my little four-year-old grandson here because he thinks I don't laugh. And I laugh a lot. I like to laugh. But why would God ever need to forgive you then? If he never changed and you never changed, why would God ever need to forgive you? Did you ever need to forgive your children just because they spilled milk? Did you need really honestly need to forgive them because they did some things that uh, they acted like a child? No, you correct. You know, you bring protection. You help them. But you don't hold anything against you. And I know Donna's not holding it against me that I threw a sugar away. I, I don't think I need to say, baby, would you forgive me? You lied. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a lie. you <laughs> Some, sometimes I need to fix this real quick. Sometimes I need to hear that, Lord. Oh, you need to hear that. All right, baby, forgive me. I'm sorry. So we found out one of the Greek meanings for forgive is different than what, what it really means. He's given the revelation of something that was before. He forgave that to us. Does that make sense? He forgave that. You know, if Donna comes to me and says, baby, would you, would you buy me a house? Well, baby, I forgave that to you over 14 years ago. I already gave it to you. That's what that means. And we think, and also there's a place that means to drive things away from you. If it says, if you admit 
that there's mark missing in your life that don't represent who you are and you don't you don't say well I have a right for this or whatever then the Word of God and the Spirit of God is faithful to drive that away from you if I come if so if I come to my mom and daddy and say mama you know every time I pick up the milk I, I drop I drop it and I know I shouldn't drop it would you teach me how to hold the glass would you teach me not to put it on the edge over here so you can teach them and you can educate them and you can drive that mark missing away from them right you know you can use that in any area so that's what God does for us and that's what we should do for one another when we come and and like I come and I say you know Wanda I really I've said this before but I'm really struggling with ice cream I, I eat it every day and I'm tempted constantly every time I draw by Brahms I see that picture Wanda can say well Roy why don't you drive a mile away from there don't go by Brahms you know it's okay to have some ice cream but every day <laughs> You know, so, so that you get it? Yes, yes. And so he doesn't have to forgive us like he's holding something against us. We need to realize that he, he gave us our nature already a long time ago. He gave us his love and his love does not waver. His love is always for you. He's never against you. Well, yeah, God loves you, but no, there is no but. God didn't create a place called hell for people who make bad decisions. You, the, the bad decisions produces your own hell. <laughs> it really does. So he gave us a revelation of something that always was. Always, every instant in the New Testament, the word forgive then is it'll drive it away from you. So I think that part's good. I think we should say, Father, I, I know that I'm still willingly involving myself in things that are not good for me. And I, I ask that you help me to, to be able to resist those things, resist those temptations. And he does. You know how he does it? He shines his love on you. When, you. when you get love from God, when you get your peace from God, you're not gonna need cocaine. You're not gonna need marijuana to bring you peace. You're not gonna, I'm not preaching against things, but I'm just saying people go to alcohol for peace. People go to all kinds of stuff because they need peace. Are you guilty, Donna? <laughs> Don't, don't lift your hands up. <laughs> Donna, that's funny. I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about this wretched woman back there. <laughs> I've never seen anybody raise their hands up. <laughs> Does anybody smoke marijuana in here? <laughs> that's funny. I love that. <laughs> I got a confession. <laughs> But you know what we do? We go to things for pain, do we not? For, for a, I had horrible headaches for many, many, many years. Bad stress headaches in the furniture industry. And the doctor gave me Fiorinol, which is just codeine and aspirin. And I took it for years. I, mean, I didn't take it every day, but maybe one or two or three a month. But I took it for a long time. And I just finally said, Lord, I think taking, my doctor kept saying, it's okay, you can keep taking it. But I just said, Lord, I think this is, not good to take something for 20 years and I'm, it's not an opioid it's just you know but it made the pain go away but I finally said Lord I'm just tired of the pain you know and so by faith I'm gonna quit taking this and I've never had one of those stress migraine type headaches ever again since then so what did I do I can it wasn't a mark missing against God but it wasn't good for me it wasn't expedient for me and I finally woke up and thought 20 years of taking this two or three times a month or four times a month might not be good for my body. So I'd rather just get rid of the pain. Wouldn't you just get, wouldn't you rather get rid of whatever it is that's, that we've got a, a world's off, uh, I can't try to think of the word. There's a word I'm trying to think of. Their answer, the world's answer mm -hmm. is always comes with side effects. Oh, yes. So what we say is father, and we may not know why we're taking it. We may not know why we're going to this. We may not know why we're angry all the time. And we just say, Lord, you know the cause of it. So I just, I admit that there's something in me that makes me go to something else for peace. Yeah. And so will you just be my peace? Mm -hmm. I, I, you are my peace, but we'll, I want you to be, I want to come to you for my peace. Yeah. I want, and I'm preaching to me too. I want to come to you for whatever it is I think I need out there. Yeah. And he's faithful yes. to be your peace. Yeah because he always was your peace. He's faithful to be your health because he's always been your health, yes. right? Amen. 
He's faithful to be your true supply because he's always your spirit. God is spirit. Spirit has always been your supply. Well, that just sounds so simple. It just can't be true. <laughs> but it is true. So the word sin, you know, people worry about sin and all that. But really, sin is sickness, mental illness, traducing actions. It's a sin to be sick. It's a sin to be mentally ill. It's a sin to have Alzheimer's. It's a sin to, to get old. <laughs> Amen? It's a sin for my joints to begin to be hurting and things like that. So it just means miss the mark. It's sickness, mental illness, anything. And that's why I tell people all the time, the women that followed Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene and all of them, they weren't demon-possessed. They didn't have, Mary Magdalene didn't have seven demons in her. Seven is the number of, of completeness. Well, she was the complete manifestation of what Adam had produced. She was mentally ill. And he just brought them back to their right mind. That's all he did. He just healed them. But yet everybody wants them to be demon-possessed and everything. So none of these things causes a person to be unrighteous. None of them cause you to be ungodly because... They were always righteous and always godly. You have always been godly. Isn't that the good news, Mike? Yes. No matter what they said about you, when I put they in there, it can be religion, it can be the world or whatever, you've always been righteous. You've always been holy. You're not who they said you were. Well, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> so now when we possess this understanding that Jesus was the uh, apocalyptic disclosure of all things of God, then we should understand that you cannot attach the word new to us anymore. We weren't made new at the cross. Let that sink in, and I know I'm going to get some emails, but we were not made new in the resurrection. Well, what about he made all things new? Well, I'm going to explain that to you. When he said, Mother, I make all things new, that, you know, in other words, it, it, I'll, I'll show it to you. I don't want to preach it, get ahead of it. So, in our experience, we become a new creation. In our experience, we become a new creation. How many times have I talked about somebody on the streets that has all kinds of money waiting for them? They have an inheritance waiting for them. You know, uh, I am who I am today, but I promise you, if I won a lottery, my experience would be even greater. There would be a new freshness come into my life. I would travel every day. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I would have all the ice cream I want. <laughs> no, but it would it would change it would it would change my experiences. Correct. There's a survey that's a, a thing that's come about uh, out about money making you happy, and they were saying that in a sense it does make you happy. But happy and, and a preacher got on explained it on the radio. I was listening on the radio yesterday. Happiness is not what you need to live out of. It's joy is what you need to live out of. But money can make you happy if you spend it on things that have people do things for you so you can have more time with your family or you can do other things, then you can be happy. But when the money goes away, you're not happy anymore. But joy and joys, God's joys and mercies are new every morning. In other words, the revelation of it becomes greater. The joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. It's our strength. It's not. I, I cannot be happy, but I can still have joy in my life. And I look for that joy in my life. So I don't need to become new. I don't say, oh, God, make me new. I want to be new. And that's what we thought happened. The minute you shook hands with the preacher, prayed the sinner's prayer, I always thought that was weird. How did I become new? I taught it, but I really didn't understand it at all. So we can only use the word new with our experiences. We have a new experience today. We have a new understanding I am, I am experiencing things of who I am now that I never experienced 25 years ago. I'm experiencing the peace of God like I never experienced the peace of God. I have learned to enter into the rest of God. That's a new experience. I'm experiencing the rest of God. Does that make sense to you? So I want to read 2 Corinthians 5.17 <clears throat> from my translation and explanation. You know, we said, behold, all things become new, right? It says, because, Paul's talking, and he's, he's, because of everything he said in the previous verses, he's explaining the gospel and who we are. He said, because of what I just taught you, if any man sees and understands what was revealed, he, she, they possess a new awareness. The false awareness of who you thought you were 
is swallowed up and made void because of the truth. Stop, look, and listen. Because that's what the word behold means. Like coming to a, you ever been to a, the old traffic signs that, where trains are coming across? Stop, look, listen. Your awareness is now fresh and new. And your life experience will now change. Say it again. It's on Facebook. Okay. Because of what I just taught you, if any man sees and understands what was revealed, he, she, they possess a new awareness. You caught up with me? Mm -hmm. The false awareness of who you thought you were is swallowed up and made void because of the truth. Stop Look and listen. Your awareness is now fresh and new, and your life experiences will now change. They added the word all things. It wasn't there. Isn't that powerful? It's powerful. I mean, how much has your experience, your life changed because you know who you are now? Yes. How much? How about your prayer life? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. How about how you treat other people? Yes. Amen. Everything changes when your awareness is fresh and new. But see, you can't just stop because the awareness that we got from my pastor Hibbard that I love so much and I miss, he's passed away. That was one level of awareness. Then the awareness that we got from Brother Garner was a greater awareness, right? And, and it, was, it wasn't complete. It wasn't whole. And he knew that. He knew there was much more to learn. But I'm telling you the awareness that we have now has literally catapulted us into a higher understanding of the heavenlies and who we are. And we're just going to spend the rest of our life going through the whole Bible, just showing these pictures over and over and over. So isn't that great? But we need to stop what you're doing and look and listen. Stop your dead works. Stop beating yourself up. Stop beating other people up. Stop accusing people. Look. Look at God. Don't let somebody else tell you who God is. You look at God. You experience God. And God is nothing but love. There is no wrath as far as the English language goes. There's no wrath in God. There's no, he's not retributive. He doesn't need appeasement, which means he, you don't need to do anything to please God. He's not like my wife that needs me to pay for throwing that sugar away. <laughs> We're going to go buy it today, I promise you. So Jesus, my... See, Jesus, it's not a legal transaction that Jesus might have done something to change us. And that's what we were taught. See, and what we've done, and I like what Kay says here, we, we took the cross and made it time sensitive. And we taught that before the cross, everybody was unrighteous. Everybody was unholy. I even taught in 1980s that no, man did not have a spirit until they said, I do. And then the Spirit of God came inside of them. And so that was all wrong. So we made a time sense that it has something to do with it took place at the cross, but your time wasn't until you said, I do. And then when you said, I do, then you became new and you were saved and you got your ticket to go to heaven someday. But it did nothing about life today. Now, yes, I will admit that many people that quote, got saved, they had an experience. Donna had an experience. I know she did. It was a fabulous experience. But still, through life, she hasn't, nor have I, really experienced living out of our spirit until the last 10, 15 years or so. We still had struggles just like everybody else had because we knew we were saved, but we also were still trying to please God in the, in the things that we did. You know, we knew if we died, we'd go to heaven. But it had nothing to do with that event, but we thought it did. And so therefore, what did we do with other people? We judged that they won't. We made the decision and we decreed, because that's what judge means. We made the decision, we decreed that they are not going to go to heaven until, right? So we judged people ourselves. I like the movie, The Shack. That's why, you know, the wisdom talked to Mac and said, you already judged. You've already judged. Why does God need to? You already judged him. You know, so of course, experience must have a moment of realization, and that's what we want to do. So, so some preachers teach a, fear, a fearful judgment coming 
Uh, most of the books that we read, Ray, uh, Late Great Planet Earth, I don't read it, but I have. Uh, all the Left Behind series. I'm surprised they haven't come up with some new series, but they're making movies out of it. You know, and they're making lots of money because people feed on fear, right? Why do you think all the shows are so big out there like the zombies today, The Walking Dead? They're still watching those things. You know, they feed on fear. Uh, most of the, a lot of movies that are really popular are, are the destruction of planet Earth and the end of the world and people just feed on it. Oh, well, it's good. No, it's not. It's not of God. God's not the author of fear. So they don't understand the judgment of God. They, they, they relate it to time and the judgment of God was from the beginning. It was the, the, the decree, the decision was if you feed from teachers that teach on the knowledge of good and evil, it will cut you off from your knowledge of me. You will feel less than. You won't boldly enter into being the throne room of God that you are. You won't live in the cool of the day anymore. And that's what Adam did. So the decree was, if you do this, and the consequences was, Adam did it, man did it, and man's still doing it today. They willingly go set under ministry, and they read books and everything else that teaches the knowledge of good and evil. And they, there's a lot of psychobabble books out there that you go buy at bookstores trying to tell you what you can do to be. Psychobabble is just from the sense realm. It's just nothing but confusion. And they're still doing that. We know God decreed this. We know God's righteous judgment was at the creation of the world. And this is when God decreed it. And so he gave man the choice. He gave the man the choice. He even decreed that man was after his image and likeness. There, there, these were righteous judgments of God. So he said, if you quit listening to me, to the spirit of truth, if you quit listening to me and you don't listen to the spirit of the truth, then you're going to be cut off from the knowledge of me, right? So I like the name of our church, Tree of Life Fellowship, because he said, feed from Tree of Life ministers. Feed, and, and you know, you can have the name Tree of Life and still be teaching the knowledge of good and evil, right? You, you can't, but they quit listening to God. And, and people quit listening to God today. They listen to more what men say about God then they listen to God. And I say this again, we went to a funeral of my good friend, Bob, Bob Childers, and the preacher got up there and all he talked about was Jesus. He never talked about the Father. And we long to be with Jesus again someday. And the reason why is because they painted God as an angry, fearful God, and people were afraid to face God, right? But Jesus, Jesus is always praying for us, Jesus gets his bread. Jesus works miracles for us because all they can think of is the earth walking Jesus. And people want the earth walking Jesus because they don't want to be who they be. They don't, want, they don't want to grow up and take responsibility and learn who they are. But people are afraid of God. What did you hear about God, Mike, all your life? When you die, you're going to stand before God, aren't you? And you're going to answer, every, you're going to, answer to everything that you did. I heard that all my life, you know? Or you're going to stand, some people say you're going to stand before an angel and he's going to look through his book. And I'm telling you, your page was really rugged. You know, he, he, he erased your name and then he wrote it back down and he erased your name. In fact, they had to get about 24 pages for Donna Misi. Yes. We need a bleach bit. A bleach bit, yeah. Need to bleach it. You know, and there's been all kinds of holes in there, but I'm sorry. You didn't repent before you did the last one, so you go through door number two. That's what we were taught. It's not true. So Isaiah 6, 46, 10, you don't need to turn there, but it says, declaring the end from the beginning and for the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do my pleasure. In other words, I created you the way you are. This is the way you are your entire life. If you die in your body, you're still going to be the way I created you. You're my son, and there's no gender there. You are the image of me. You're righteous. You're holy. But in the Old Testament, God did speak to him and said, you shall die as princes. You're, you're the prince of this world, but you shall die as princes. We should have figured that out. Because everybody in this funeral home that's laying here in a casket, they died as the prince of this earth. The prince of this earth was not a devil. The prince of this earth is us. 
God is king. Yes, Jesus in his earth walk was manifesting the prince of this realm. He had full reign over this planet yes, as God's son. Yes. He could have stayed here. Luke chapter 4, he saw in his mind's eyes the kingdoms of the earth. And he knew it was given to him. And he could have stayed here and ruled. And people would go, we would still be going to Jesus for whatever we needed. But he knew that we were the rightful prince of this earth. And even I think it was John that says, now the true light of this earth shines. That's us. Man, he lit our light, but religion came and blew it out. But sadly, we allowed it, though, because we didn't study to show ourselves approved. We shouldn't have sat here and let them tell us what it, we should have gotten the word ourselves a long, long time ago. So what are we doing here at Tree of Life Fellowship? What's going on at Kay's Fellowship? And other places we're helping you remember who you are but see we're learning it as you're learning it just a little bit ahead of you but we're learning it as you we're helping you remember who you are you're not who you think you are I love at one time we believe the grace and forgiveness of God were products of the cross now we know it's always been we have worshiped the cross have we not we wear crosses around us and I taught you about that once and if you got one that's all right but that's an instrument of death I don't worship the cross, you know, I don't, I, 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 that's not my badge, you know, and I, and I don't call myself Christian anymore. I'm, a, I'm part of the community of believers because I think Christian leaves a lot of people out. Well, I'm a Christian, who are you? Well, I'm a Buddhist, oh, well, I'm sorry, All right? So I don't, we don't need titles. We're just believers. We believe in God. We believe in the love and the mercy and the grace of God. It's forever and forever and ever, and it can't change. It doesn't have to endure you. I forget the number, but it's something like 80 times. I may be off, but in the, in the Old Testament, it says, the, it'll give thanks for the Lord, uh, for the mercy, for his mercy endures forever. Well, endure to a lot of people means it'll, it's always there no matter what, but also it can mean he has to endure what you go through. I, but they added the word endure, you know, so it just says, oh, give thanks for the mercy forever. It's, it's forever and forever and forever. It's mercies, and they're not what we think, that he's not giving us what we deserve. It's just what he did from the foundation of the world. I mean, I thank God that I'm born in America. I, I am. I, to me, I, I just, I thank God for my life. That's part of his mercies. He didn't withhold it from anybody else. You know, and I believe all countries can be as blessed as America. There was a time when America was thankful for God. There was a time when the majority here trusted in God. Yes. Maybe we didn't have the awareness we have today, but we trusted in God. Our money says in God we trust. Well, the, today that's a lie for the, the majority. It's a lie. Even people, to tell you the truth, we didn't really trust God even in, while we were in church. Because we were always expecting God to do something for us, and we were always blaming God. So, First Timothy one nine: If we make the cross of Jesus uh, and the grace and rest time sensitive, uh, then we're in trouble. You know, you you got You got You got There's got to be a time in your life when you said the sinner's prayer, like my mama said. Did they say the name of Jesus before they die? So it's all time sensitive and it's not. Grace is a person. Grace is the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is Jesus revealing God. And grace is us revealing God. Grace is our spirit. God told Paul, my grace is sufficient. You know, so if you've got a problem and you come to me, I'll listen, but we're not going to major on it. But I'm going to tell you, your spirit is sufficient. Just by faith, make a withdrawal. You may not understand it, but just by faith say, Father, I draw peace from you today. I draw uh, everything that I think I need. I know that you have supplied that. So by faith, until I totally understand how to live out of it, by faith today, I'm just going to do it. Be it unto me. You know, like little Mary, she had no idea how she got pregnant. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine uh, somebody coming to you when you were 14 years old and said, you're pregnant. And you're thinking, uh, I'm supposed to have been with a man to do that. No, God impregnated you. And you're going to give birth to, the, to a, a full manifestation of the Son of God. Well, now here's what I'm saying to you. You're pregnant. What do you mean I'm pregnant? You're pregnant with a man-child. And it's getting awful big. 
You look like it's time to deliver. But you know what's been holding you back? The dragon. Religion. In the Old Testament, religion was just pictured as a little bitty snake. The serpent. Anybody remember what it means? Yes, yes. Whisper, whisper. But the more importantly, it's nakash. Hiss or whisper or learn from one's own experience. Oh, yeah. They begin to learn from their own experience. They, they cut themselves off from the, mm -hmm. they begin to learn from the sense realm. So, and the Old Testament is pictured as a little snake. When you get to the book of Revelation, it's a great big dragon. And the sun clothed woman that has a revelation is travailing to give birth to the man child, which is a full grown, mature man of God. And the dragon sitting there waiting to devour it. Reminds me of Emma when she was little. Okay. <laughs> Just waiting, but it doesn't prevail. She gives birth. So some teachers uh, believe and teach the cross was time sensitive. There was no grace or forgiveness prior to the cross, and there's no grace or forgiveness until you say their sinner's prayer. And that's not true. No way, no way at all. We read, for example, about Noah who got drunk and he acted inappropriately and uh, scripture records that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was always there. Yes. We're going to show you later on a lot of people in the Old Testament, God was always there. God never left them. I told you last week, God chased Adam. Adam, Adam left in his awareness, the realm of spirit and in the, the Old Testament physical picture. It's just a picture. It's a parable. You know, people want to make it literal, but it's a parable about what happened. Jesus always spoke in parables. And God clothed them. He just went with them. So they, he clothed them in understanding. He kept saying, Adam, this is who you are, Adam. And Adam wouldn't listen. Wouldn't listen. So he sent prophets and prophets spoken. They wouldn't listen. And he sent the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, which I say is a Christophany. And they wouldn't listen. He called Abraham up to the mountain and said, bring your son. I want to show you something. I'm like, and he knew he was going to come to try to sacrifice his son, but he didn't say do it. He just said, come to the mountain. I'll show you which mountain to send to. He never said to sacrifice your son, but Abraham was used to that. He grew up in that. So, oh, God wants my son. And even if he knew that God would deliver him, God still did not want that. And he said, Abraham, no. I don't want sacrifice. I will provide myself. If you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself. And Abraham didn't listen, so he went and found him a ram. I know I've said this before, but y'all can't repeat very much what I say, so you need to hear it over and over. <laughs> he, he, he went and found his own lamb and still did it. He didn't listen, right? But God was still there. And God was with Abraham all the way through his journey, just like he was with Adam. Always saying, come up higher, come up higher. This is not where I created you to live. This is not the realm you're supposed to be in. Come up higher. Mm -hmm. And God's been doing that for over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Jesus in his earth walk was trying to bring people up higher. And he said, I've been trying to share these things with you guys and you can't bear them. You just, but don't worry. I'm going to send you a lot more teachers, comforters. Isn't this comforting? Mm -hmm. I'm a comforter. I'm not ashamed of it at all. I'm a comforter teacher. And I bring a message that brings great comfort. Did the rapture message ever bring you comfort? No. That, that, and and, and uh, where is it? It talks about a rapture. but what for, they, they call it rapture. It's not rapture. Yeah, what talks about caught up and we which remain will rise up and forever be with the Lord. Not the Lord, but with, in other words, one with God. It says comfort you one another with these words. Well, if that's about a rapture, it never comforted anybody. Because I defy anybody to tell me any given time in your life where you felt like you were rapture compliant. <laughs> Can anybody tell me there was ever a time in your life that you honestly felt that if a rapture took place, that you would go? Donna, I know you've had lots of hidden sins. I know. <laughs> Donna's just looking there. She's really trying to figure out by this time. I'm talking to Donna Meese, not my wife. 
If, if I look this way, it's Donna Misi. If I look this way, it's Donna, my wife. But honestly, those of you on the internet, can you really say there was ever, if you believed in a rapture, can you ever say that there's an honest to God truth that there's nothing in your life that condemns you and your understanding that you knew that if you died tomorrow, you would boldly just walk right on to heaven? No, you can't. So something was wrong. That was not comforting at all. At all. God's grace has always been there with us. Grace always was. Righteousness always was. God always, Jehovah, was always Jehovah's Sid Canoe or righteousness. He wasn't somebody that's angry. Five more minutes will be done. It's all right. I feel like I've gone a long time, but I haven't. So for the grace of God, excuse me, Titus 2.11, I'll read it. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Hath appeared. It's always been teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, in the present world. So who hath appeared? It was God in Jesus. God in Jesus appeared. He was always the grace of God, and now the grace of God appeared as, as the man Jesus, who was very much, again, man, very much God. So I want to show this to you. And you need to listen to this, and so obey what you're hearing, right? Hear, uh, hear what was said and be able to repeat it. And the reason obey means to be able to repeat it is because when you walk into the kitchen and the stove's on and mama told you not to touch it, you're going to be able to repeat, oh, mom said not to touch that. If you obey what's been said today, then when you go out into this world, because we're still in it, we're not of it, and a temptation comes to you to go after something to bring you what God does, then you can say, oh, wait a minute. God can give me that peace. All right? God, whatever, if, if we will obey, we'll hear that voice that says, this is what was said. If I do this, I will be burnt. If I go after anything that God can give me, there are consequences to it that aren't, won't be good. If I listen to wisdom, David talked about it being a her, embrace wisdom. Would that not protect you all the days of your life? Wisdom would say, uh, you don't need to get a $50,000 car if you can't afford it, you know. Wisdom would say, you don't need whatever it is that you're going to that's other than God. So this ungodliness and worldly lust and all that stuff is literally just going to the world for your help. Doing things that doesn't, ungodly is something that you're doing that doesn't represent who you really are. It doesn't mean you are ungodly. It's just those things that you do that re doesn't represent who you are. So who hath appeared? It was God. So uh, the word, uh, let's see. Oh, the word now where it says in this present world, and it also says now, it says it's, it's a forever world. It's A-E-I, and it says ever, always, earnestly, and sober. So we need to be sober about that and not be drawn away at all from, from God. We need to realize that it is now. And, and, and another thing Kay always says, and you hear it, is live in the isness of God, the awareness of God, constantly in the awareness of God. I want to see if I'm leaving things. Oh, I'm almost done. I'm almost done here. So, so we don't want to be drawn away by, it's not what you do, but it's by sin consciousness, right? If there's anything that you believe that can separate you from God, then that produces a sin consciousness. And I like what uh, my good pastor friend years ago said. He said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I'm still redeemed. Even though I mess up, I'm still redeemed, I'm still holy, I'm still righteous, you know, and so we've got to understand that. So in grace and the finished work circles, they're involved in this big deb debate about a dirty word called inclusion. It's uh, unbelievable that they, they, they fight over it. Now I see it on Facebook, but I'm telling you, we're all included in God. We're not included that we were made new, but we're all included in God. Jesus came to reveal the truth to everyone, not just Jews, not just Christians, but to everyone, right? Yes. 
who was it that was Peter that had the vision uh, to go to Cornelius' house? Yes. And he saw all these unclean animals and God said, eat. And he said, no, Lord, no, Lord. And he said, don't call dirty what I've made clean. Now, he didn't make them clean at the cross. See, that was before the cross, I think, wasn't it? No, no, excuse me. It was after the cross. Yeah, yeah. But but he didn't do that at the, he didn't do that in Jesus. The word made means create. He created everything. And he said, don't call it dirty. And what have we done with people? We call them dirty. And it's real hard when we look at those people, uh, radical Islamic terrorists, and we call them dirty. We look at people in the streets and the gutters and we call them dirty. We don't want them in our pretty churches. We don't want them on the front row, right? We, we've judged people and we've, we've judged them and, and we got tired of them and just over and over and over they make mistakes and we, we judge them and we call them dirty. God said, don't do that. We're all one. Every one of us are one. So all were included in the beginning. All were included in the beginning. And the reason that we have so much struggle today is just man's choices. Man creates their own environment, all right? So let's go all, uh, oh, real quick though. So what we're going to do, and we'll be doing more and more, is we've got to retweak, or we got to tweak crucified, died, buried, quick, and raised and seated. Because we've taught crucified, died, buried is getting away, uh, getting rid of the man that we were. And we taught that quick and raised and seated was making a brand new being. That's not true. Crucified, died, and buried was Jesus being that final sacrifice to stop the sacrificial system. And it was doing away with that, that false, illegal, degenerate nature activity. They didn't have a degenerate nature, but their activity was, was the result of their belief system, right? Their awareness produced that. But Jesus swallowed that up and destroyed it. He destroyed death, hell, and the grave. That's not living as, as God. And then he also revealed the love of God. So that's why we've got to show and crucify, died, and buried. And we'll do that. So now we can go all the way back to where I translated the scripture and go to the end of this. And I'm going to read it again. Because of what I just taught you, Roy Richmond just taught you. If any man sees and understands what was revealed in this, ver this teaching today, he she they possess a new awareness did you get a new awareness today did you really okay so the false awareness that you brought in here with you or you came in a year ago with or whatever of who you thought you were is swallowed up and made void because of this truth so stop stop it stop beating yourself up there's a, a, a thing on youtube that you'll have to see someday and i forget the actor's name you remember what i'm talking about tim the one that was the counselor, and he charged fifteen dollars. Bob Newhart. He charged fifteen dollars for fifteen minutes of counseling. And so, lady comes in. She sits down. She's pouring her heart out with him, and and just really unloading. And he would. I'm paraphrasing what he did, but he said, "Is that everything?" And she said, "Yeah." He said, "All right. I want you to write this down. Are you ready? Write it down." And he looks at her and he says, stop it! <laughs> that was 10 minutes into it. And she said, what? And he said it again. He screamed, stop it! <laughs> and then she made a comment about, you know, well, that was only 10 minutes, so I owe you $10. And he said, no, it's 15. She said, well, then I want five more minutes. You know, so... <laughs> and then he answers the same way. But that's the truth. Stop. Look. Listen, your awareness is fresh. So now you can have new life experiences. See, that these things that happened in the Old Testament, these were life experiences. They were not the judgment of God. They were not the punishment of God. They created their life experience. They created the flood. They created wars. We today create wars. We create, man creates their own life experiences. They, they can create famines. Our government can pay farmers to not grow wheat to control the prices, yes. right? Yes. We, we put, we out of greed, we want 
great big chicken breasts instead of the way they're supposed to be. So we put chemicals in it and we put hormones and then we get cancer and we get all kinds of problems. And people say, why, why? We create it because of greed, because of choices. So we are creators. Somebody got mad at me for saying that once, but we are creators. I don't create the planet Earth. I, I don't create physical things, but I create my environment. So if you, if you will stop what you're doing and allow this new awareness of who you are, then you're going to walk out and you're going to create a better environment for you. You're going to make wise decisions, right? And you're going to go forth and love people. And you're going to be the cherubim that you're created to be. It's not about you. It's about how can you bless other people? Amen. John F. Kennedy had a little knowledge of that. He stood up and said, ask not what your government can do for you, but ask what you can do for the, your country. You know, ask not what your country, but ask what you can do. Ask what you can do tomorrow. Wake up in the morning and say, Father, I know I'm going to come into the path of people that have needs. And I know that, that I can be the answer. Yeah. So help me be aware of that. Help me be aware when I walk into the grocery store and there's a lady in front of me and she's, she's having to put food back because she doesn't have enough money. Help me to be willing to reach into my pocket and pay for that food. Yes. Help me be willing to bless people with a kind word, right? So you're creating an environment and guess what? You get it back. Yes. It just comes back to you. Yes. I'm not talking about the money. I'm just talking about really, it, it, there, is a law, there is a law of attraction. Yes. And what you give out comes back. So let's give out what we're supposed to give out. Let's give out the love of God, the grace of God. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. Donna, Amen. thanks for conf It's been a long time, Donna Meese, since somebody confessed something. <laughs> and I, I'm just going to believe. It started with your confession. <laughs> it started, started, started with me. <laughs> I love you guys. You guys on the internet, I love you. Hello, Sharon Duvall. Glad you're here. There's a lot of people on there, but we just, we love all of you. We appreciate you. Uh, you're the reason we do this. You're the reason we grind out the word and uh, we want people. We don't want it just for ourselves. We study for other people. So we're here to bless you and keep an eye out again. Uh, some guy asked me if I was just trying to sell books. We're not, but we, we want people to get this. And sometimes you really need the book to read it and grind it out and remember. So within a week or so, I'll put a notice out that it'll be on my web page that you can order it. It'll come in a notebook form. And then uh, Kay will also let you know how you can order it from her too. We'll give you the price pretty soon. Uh, I thought about a thousand, but Kay said we should talk about that a little bit first. So, <laughs> just kidding. You. <laughs> just kidding you. <laughs> I used to tell people years ago when, when we taught the tithe and everything, I always told people, today we needed to put one more zero. <laughs> a lady came up to me. She said, oh, well, mine would be 10 cents now. So, <laughs> so I quit that. So. Love you. Wish we didn't have to leave. I could talk to you all day long. But bless you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, Vicki. Vicki Friedrichs there. Good to see you. We love you. We miss you.